Okay. Live-ish. Yeah, so here they finally replaced the movie theater with, like, the, I don't know if I've, I've mentioned this in the past. We had this terrible movie theater with these awful yeah. seats, and I refused just on principle alone to ever see a movie in that theater until they fixed the seats. Well, they fixed the seats. Now they got these the fancy reclining ones that you can book in advance through the web, show up with your ticket, go to your assigned seating, recline, perfect. That so so amazing. we're going to go see that. And, and they don't have a lot of people in each theater anymore there's only like i don't know maybe like 40 or 50 seats in the theater yeah so i live in a college town which means that our theater is one of the ones that has the uh tiered seating that mm -hmm. goes up 10 million miles yeah. and you're all in identical seats and they're fine but everything is fine and if you want to balance the 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 recognition that the movie is three hours long with the you still want decent sound that isn't totally off center you just wait you wait until the crowd is low and you can get the good seat yeah yeah, yeah. hey everybody i'm gonna say hello to Andy Cowley, Astro B, Bort Clankar, Guido Bibra, Harry M, Janelle Duncan, Jim Smith, John Suffield, John Victor, Justin Wilcox, Lillian Brennan, Linda Sedik, Nancy Grazio, Nichols of the Yard, Ocean McIntyre, Paranor, S. Wahlberg, Sean Kenny, Susie Murph, Tak Tang, Thomas Traniker, Wayne Johnson, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this absolutely normal episode <laughs> of Astronomy Cast. I had a idea for topic something that i don't think we've covered which is multiple star systems so we've done binary star systems but we haven't done okay. multiples and did you know myth busting that the vast majority of stars are not in multiple star systems the vast majority of stars are not in single star systems no, they are in single star systems when the hell did that become a thing? Last couple of years. So so what it turns out is that red dwarf stars are generally single singletons. They're not in multiple star systems. While and they make up the and they make up the vast star. majority. So the the bright stars are in multiple star <sighs> systems, but the red dwarfs aren't, and the red dwarfs are the are the vast majority. So there you go. New piece of information. I uh I I was able to I, I stump astronomers all the time with this one now it's my it's my go to if I wanted to that means I can't use my favorite phrase which is four out of every three stars is in a binary <laughs> yeah I forgot I'll I'll send you the paper but it's you know within the last couple of years so hey, cool yeah so when people are mentioning cool. limit fluid consumption yeah uh, Chad is off to go see Avengers today and I said and remember stay dehydrated. Like, don't drink any coffee, don't drink any water, don't buy a pop. Pop is soda, by the way, for you Americans. Don't buy a pop, and you uh, and you should be able to make it through the three hours. Three hours. Madness. I need to rewatch the um, last movie because I realized I have no memory of the last half hour of it because I was watching it on an airplane to try and stay awake. Right. And having no memory of the last half hours is a problem <laughs> it's it i mean it's on netflix it's on netflix for yeah. you guys in the u yeah so so yeah, i, I watched it first it. time in the theaters and then i watched it again on netflix with the family and yeah so like i know there was a snap and that's all i know mm. other than the guardians of the galaxy people were involved and there was dancing again right and that is a not that is not enough of a memory of that movie so Rewatching shall occur. Get her done. I shall. I shall. Uh, let me know when you're ready to begin. Um, I, I'm almost there. All right. Well, for those of you who have stumbled into this, you have no idea what it is that we're doing. We are about to record a live episode of Astronomy Cast. We're going to record it. You're going to watch. Then we'll stick around until uh, the end of the hour and answer your questions about space and or astronomy. I, I'd like to cut that a bit short today because tomorrow I'm streaming for yes. 10 straight hours and we're not fully set up. Yeah, like nobody's 
given me an invite yet. I realize this. It was sent to Universe Today's email, and apparently that was the wrong choice. Probably the wrong email at Universe Today. There's only info. Only info is the acceptable email oh, address there. Oh, crap. No, I did Universe Today at Gmail. That does not me at all. I don't know who that is. Okay, so we invited multiple times someone who is not you. Yeah, yeah. there's my name at Gmail or info at universetoday.com. Yeah, the I two options. can find those. There you go. Dude, okay. you, I also own FraserCane.com, but it doesn't work. So you could try Universe Today at FraserCane.com, but it probably wouldn't work. In fact, I guarantee that it won't work. Uh, right. So anyway, uh, so, so to give, then tell me the, the end time. Uh, 1245? Yeah, that 12 works. 1241? Yes. Which one? Let's go with 1241 just uh, to challenge you. Perfect. No problem. Okay. All right. Well, then we better get started. I'm pressing record. I have also pressed record. I am not using the right mic. Damn it. Damn it, Audacity. Why do you do this to me? Because you're using a Macintosh, and Macs are too smart for their peripherals. I love my Mac. Okay, I'm pressing record again. I'm using the correct mic. You did it! Okay, here we go. Hi, Susie. Hello, Susie. Astronomy Cast, episode 528, Modern Astronomy of the American Southwest. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I am doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. Gearing up, getting prepared to go and watch some big three-hour movie that's going to be happening that, is, that has been released yesterday at the time that we're recording. People are probably familiar with it. Uh, I'm going to have to go off coffee for a couple of days, uh, really reduce the amount of liquids, and be able to make my way through a three-hour movie. But I'm looking forward and to it. And the only spoiler we have is that it's three hours long. That's all we know, yeah. Spoiler alert, it's a long movie. And then, now, by the time people are listening to this, you will have already done a celebration of 365 Days of Astronomy. So where can people th find out more about what you just did? Okay, so the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast launched back in 2009, and our Astronomy Cast episodes are part of its consortium of aggregated content. Um, and we're celebrating that we have somehow done more than 10 years of podcasts. 10 yeah. years. 3,650 daily. days when it should have only been 300. That sounds like the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers. But of podcasts. But of podcasts, yeah. So, so to celebrate, we are inviting a bunch of our contributor contributors to join us on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuestX all day here in the United States, Saturday, April 27th. And uh, all of our content is going to get broken up and thrown up on YouTube afterwards, youtube.com slash C slash CosmoQuest. And uh, I hope that you'll enjoy it. It is so many voices that have helped make this possible yeah. across the decade. What a, I remember it beginning back, I think we, we, you announced it or it started up at the American Astronomical Society 10 years ago. Yep. And in Austin? It, it, that was in uh, Long LA. Beach. LA. Yeah, in Long Beach. Right. And so we launched January 2009, and we just never stopped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's a great way. I mean, if you – I mean, obviously, you should never unsubscribe from Astronomy Cast. That yeah, would be don't. the worst move. <laughs> but if you wanted another podcast that was like a – you know all those, like, beer samplers when you go and you sit down and you get a chance to it's try a, a bunch of tasty beers? It's a flight of astronomy-related podcasts. Every couple of weeks, one of my Guide to Space uh, – audio tracks comes through interviews that i've done and then there's a ton of other amazing podcasts and so it just gives you a chance to just sample all these different variety and then each one you can go and follow up and do a deep dive with with the the podcasters so i think it it's a it's a great way to sort of see what's going on with astronomy podcasting across the planet 
And and it's just cool how many people got their start with us. Morgan got his start with 365 days. Yeah. Paul has been with us since he started podcasting. So it's it's great, and it's going to be great to see so many people tomorrow or three days ago if you're listening to this on Monday. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope to catch you on the inner tubes. All right. Last week, we talked about the ancient astronomy of the American Southwest, but this is actually Pamela's stomping grounds, and she spent many a night perched atop mountains in this region, staring into the night sky with gigantic telescopes. How does astronomy get done in this region today? So let's, here's a personal anecdote, Pamela. Uh, which observatories in the American Southwest have you personally spent time extracting science data from the universe with? Uh, so science data I have gotten from Kitt Peak and from... Uh, you did McDonald's um, Observatory, right? Yeah. And then I've used data from the very large array and from Lowell Observatory. So... And then visited my, a bunch of the other ones. Yeah, yeah. And I visited a bunch of the other ones. So, and it's it's crazy how many telescopes have sprung up like yeah. mushrooms in the arid peaks of the American Southwest. And I think people don't even realize the capability, both the scale, like one, I would say one of the most powerful instruments in the entire world is there, which is a large, large binocular, binocular telescope, telescope. Uh, as well as one of the most sensitive radio telescopes. There's a bunch of, of, a pretty amazing instrument. So, but let's, I'd, I'd love to hear some of your personal anecdotes. So uh, pick oh, yeah. one of them and tell us a story about using one of their, one of the instruments. Well, I, I think for me, the most amazing experience that, that will stick with me forever was my first night observing on the McDonald observatory 30 inch this is a wide field telescope that i used for the bulk of my research while in graduate school and i was learning how to use it the person who was teaching me was just like you just need to stay awake till 5 a.m you just need to stay awake till 5 a.m and this was a winter night so there were still a good many hours after 5 a.m but about 5 a.m. as I'm melting into the desk beside him, because this is my first day on the mountain. So I drove all day, flew all day. So you fly to Odessa, drive from Odessa to McDonald, eat dinner, and then try and stay awake. So as I'm melting into the desk beside him, he like does the wake up, go look outside. And the 30-inch observatory is tucked into the side of the mountain. They've, they've blasted out a section of the granite, built the telescope in, carved the mountain so that the, the windshield doesn't hit the mountain as the dome rotates. And as I walk out the front door, all the way along the, the horizon to my right, looking out over the desert, there is lightning all along wow. the distant horizon. That lightning is reflecting off the 82 and 107 inch domes that are up the mountain from me to the left. And straight in front of me is Hyakataki, like right the, fists the comet. and fists wide. Yeah. And, and above me is the Milky Way. And it was just sort of like, you did this in a planetarium. No one would believe you that it was real. <laughs> yeah. It was just amazing. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the of the instruments that are that are there. So what are some of the facilities that that are available to astronomers in the Southwest today? Okay. So I I'm gonna basically start by listing out the consortiums of facilities that are out there and explaining how this happened. So we have McDonald Observatory, which is uh, owned and operated by the University of Texas, working in consortium with places like Penn State University. Uh, and it's sort of in West-ish Texas, right? It's in West Texas, Fort Davis. Yeah. If, if you draw... A, a triangle where El Paso is one corner of the triangle, Odessa, Texas is the other part of the triangle, and you turn it into a, a uh, equilateral triangle, Fort Davis is that other point. Now, it's, it's 
high desert, but not super high desert. So you're looking at about 6,000 feet. You will get snowed upon, but it's not significant, just enough that you can blow out the servos on the telescope domes, opening the slit if they have ice in them. This is to say I have done that. Uh, and then you have to wake up mountain staff to replace fuses for you, and they hate your guts when you do this. Um, then uh, on the adjoining mountain to McDonald, you have the Hobby Eberly Telescope, uh, which is also out there, operated by the University of Texas Working Consortium here with, with the Max Planck Institute, Penn State, uh, Kip, not Kip Peak, with the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, a whole lot of different people work in groups to build these telescopes. And there are telescopes from, for instance, Boston University out at Kitt Peak that it's basically, hey, we found a mountain peak where there's a road, where there's dormitories, can we put our telescope there with you? And the answer was yes. And, and it's, it's kind of the, oh, you have infrastructure. Can I put my telescope there too? That is how these facilities end up with so many telescopes on one mountain. So as you journey westward, you, you hit New Mexico next. And New Mexico is where we find Apache Point, where we have the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, where we have parts of the National Solar Observatory, system of telescopes uh, near Apache Point we have white sands and the very large array uh, out there in Socorro so those are the big telescopes in that particular swath of desert mm -hmm. and as you keep going west you start to get to Arizona where the mountains get taller you have uh Lowell Observatory, which gets classic amounts of snow. It's high, high desert. May may the oxygen be with you. <laughs> and and this is another one of those places where you have telescope upon telescope on this single mountain. But now we've started spreading to other mountains because the Naval Observatory is also out in that area of Arizona. And here we have one of the first interferometric systems where they were testing, how do you get multiple optical telescopes to work together? Right. Now, of course, as you get to Tucson, which is pretty much the find the darkest place on the map and go upwards, you have Kitt Peak National Observatory, Mount Graham, and Mount Lemmon all together covered in various numbers of telescopes and with kit peak in particular here you're looking at a ridge line and all along that ridge line is telescope after telescope after telescope uh so now you have actually worked you did some some research at kit peak Yes, I was a summer REU student at Kitt Peak National Observatory, and uh, I was employed by the National Radio, uh, the Nash NRAO. Uh, yeah. I was employed by the radio folks, uh, but they shared their summer experience with the National Optical Astronomy Observatories. So while my summer project was, this is me, I was writing software, I was working on writing control systems for the observatory. I in addition to writing software for a big old amazing radio dish, I also got to do observations of Shoemaker Levy 9 using the Schmidt telescope. And that was amazing. Now, of course, because it was the Schmidt telescope, Jupiter was like, two pixels across or something silly like that. So what we were observing was not the impacts, but the comet itself in the days leading up to the impact. And that was pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, it's surprising. I mean, it was surprising that we got a chance to even see the Schumacher Levy 9 impacts. And now it sort of feels like I'm surprised that we haven't had a chance to see anything that significant crash into Jupiter ever since. There's been a couple of other impacts, but to be there and be part of the observations as the whole thing was coming together must have just, like you knew that you were part of something historic. And, and that was a very special time for something like this to be happening as well, because this was when Mosaic was first coming out as a web browser. 
the very first time I used a web browser, here I'm dating myself, was at Kit Peak while we were desperately reloading and reloading, waiting for the images from the South Pole to get posted. And this was an amazing opportunity where they reopened Kit Peak, which normally is in summer shutdown for monsoon season at this point, but they opened it up because of this special experience. We had astronomers trying to take data simultaneous with visitors trying to visit and see the telescopes as they're taking data. And all of us are trying to see the data that's coming in from other places. And as a student, they were, of course, assigning us all sorts of random tasks. And I remember one of our random tasks was just to escort the, the public through the dome, letting them come in while we were starting the observations, shooing them out when the observation was over, rinse and repeat. And we had one kid come in. And the other thing that first came out that summer was light up shoes. And you have never seen so many astronomy students dive to scoop up a small child and hand it to their parents. <laughs> Turn off um, those shoes. Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, no, thou shalt not step. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One does not bring light up shoes to an observatory. No, but it, it was a really amazing experience. And that was also the first time that I learned ladybugs migrate. And this is actually mm. a problem in these observatories of the Southwest because ladybugs migrate at altitude. And one of their favorite places to collect is on the sides of observatories. <laughs> and it looks like these moving, writhing rust spots on the sides of the domes. Yeah. And it's just millions of ladybugs. That's amazing. Oh. And you will get them in your detectors. Oh, I'll they bet. Will somehow fly all the way down your, your telescope, down your, your optical assembly, and walk around on top of your CCD. It's not good. All right. So keep going uh, west. What else is there? Uh, so, so that really gets us through the primary national observatories is is with tucson mm -hmm. and flagstaff we have lowell in the naval and then with kit peak we have lemon graham and kit peak all right there uh so so let's talk a, a bit about some of the extreme most modern and cutting edge instruments that are are out there and i mentioned leading up to this that one of the most powerful instruments out there, the large binocular telescope, is is one, for example. Uh, so do you have any information on some of the more extreme telescopes that people might be able to, to see there? Well, I, I think the Hobby Everly Telescope at McDonald and the Large Binocular Telescope out at Mount Graham really stand out as this is why we build telescopes in these contiguous U.S., not the best place in the world, but easy to access facilities. Right. With the Hobby Everly Telescope, this is one of the largest telescopes in the world, and it is the lowest cost many meter telescope that has been assembled. And they pioneered this technology because you're just eight hour drive away from Austin. So when you're building an instrument, you build it at the university, you drive it out to the facility, put it up on the telescope, check things out, pull it down, put it back on, pull it down, put it back on, carry it back to Austin if you need to. And this ease of, of swapping out your equipment, being near manufacturing facilities, allowed them to pioneer this low cost technology. Yeah, there now, is a lot to be said for being able to just go put it on, take it off, tweak it, fix it, upgrade it, improve it. When you think about these enormous telescopes that are built on Hawaii, Oh, where yeah. you've got to take a boat to get there or on a mountaintop in Chile or the South Pole or space, right? And, and the ease of sticking as often happened, a graduate student in a rider truck. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's Rent a so truck. much cheaper. <laughs> Drive that truck to the top of the, to the observatory and install it. Yeah, there is a lot to be said for just the sheer convenience of being able to access your telescope and fix it, tweak it, upgrade it, change it, etc. I, I, I don't think that can go uh, understated. No, and McDonald Observatory as a graduate program, 
I, I don't think there's some place I could have been happier because it's one of the last facilities to not have night operators, which means that I, as the observer, got to handle the telescopes. I was the one who knew how to operate things. And it was when we had observers coming in from other institutions that they sent a graduate student out to do the observing. And so here you have a facility that was built thanks to a million dollar donation that somehow became 800,000 by the time it went through courts. That started the entire facility with the Otto von Struve 82 inch telescope. Over the years, we ended up with the Harlan Smith 107-inch telescope that was used with the Apollo missions. We, we have the Hobby Eberly telescope, again, built thanks to massive donations. And these are places that aren't just doing cutting-edge science, but they're training that next generation, not just on the science, but on the operations, the, the optical engineering, the instrumentation. And to get to work in a department where you have all these components, the people building the stuff, writing the software, doing the science, all in one place. Yeah, but I think it's really important to get across, right? The size of the Hobby, Hobby Eberly Telescope. It is a 10-meter telescope. It's actually a little bigger than that. That's yeah. the same size as the Keck, each of the Keck observatories on the Big Island of Hawaii, the yeah. the very large telescope, each individual telescope is is merely eight point four meters. So and, and the difference here is Hobby doesn't slew. It just rotates. It has a fixed azimuth. Right. So you can only look at some parts of the sky, which is how they did it. The the on initial the costing for it was fifteen million. They went over that. Right. But it's not a multi-billion dollar facility. Yeah, yeah. And it is a 10-meter telescope. So it's one of the most, uh, one of the largest instruments that you can get your hands on and done relatively inexpensively. One of the largest telescopes in the world and yet done really at, on, a, on a shoestring budget. The, but the, I think the, the large binocular is even more impressive. And, and this gets to what was my number one choice for, for graduate school that I was waitlisted and the first six people all said yes. Oh, no. Yeah. So my number one choice for graduate school was Arizona. And I, I didn't get into Arizona. I, I got into Texas. I got into Yale, but without funding. So I didn't go there because they right. were expensive. This was before you were the master of writing research grant proposals. Yeah. Well, yeah. I got into Texas with funding. Yeah. So it was fine. I also got into RIT with funding, but I didn't go there, clearly. Um, so, so Arizona was my number one choice. And this is because, like Texas, they have an observatory right there. But unlike Texas, instead of being eight hours away, it's a couple of hours away. <laughs> right. And there are some people that bike it. I'm right. not that insane. Yeah, it's like our access to ski hills here on Vancouver Island. Our, our ski hills is, is 45 minutes, half an hour away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and with Arizona, you have their pioneering mirror lab. And so telescopes like Wynn, which is oh Wyoming, a state that begins with the letter I, Yale, and the National Optical Astronomy Observatories. It's this consortium telescope that was built with this super flexible mirror, four meter class telescope, one of the first of its kind. And they were able to pioneer these technologies because they're so close to the University of Arizona. They pioneered these honeycomb mirrors that uh, weigh so much less by, by doing spin casting literally underneath the sports arena at the University of Arizona. You have the Lunar and Planetary yeah. Lab. And, and with all of these facilities, including the Planetary Science Institute, my new institute, all right there in Tucson, with access to Kitt Peak, which also has one of the NRAO radio telescopes up there. It also has a solar facility up there. It's, it's a great place to pioneer technologies, to spearhead research, and to figure out what is the next big thing. Now, one of the problems that they ran into is the next big thing didn't fit on Kitt Peak. And so it was recognized in the late 80s oh, expletive, we need to find someplace else to start building, which is where they started looking at the other peaks that were around the city of Tucson, which has a lot of really good dark sky ordinances, which has a really good infrastructure. And they landed on Mount Graham, which led to no end of controversy for 
about a decade. <laughs> the problem here is each of these individual mountains is its own little ecosystem because as you go downwards, it gets hot and deserty. And as you go upwards, you end up with really nice pine forests, cooler temperatures. You can pick the climate you want to live in just by picking the altitude you big your, build your house at and which side of the mountain, the rainy or the dry side that you build on. And this also means that you can end up with divergent evolution on the different mountain peaks. And there is a tribe of red squirrels <laughs> on the top of Mount Graham where the large binocular telescope was set to be built. This is initially slightly different plans changed over the years. And originally the Ohio state was going to be building this telescope. And then environmental activists got involved. They had negotiated land rights with one part of the local Indian tribe, but then a different part of the local Indian tribe was like, no, we're being taken advantage of, but it turned out those were actually white people. Uh, there was a whole lot of crazy chaos involved in building this facility. But after about a decade of struggle, they broke ground and both the Vatican Observatory and the Large Binocular Telescope coexist with the red squirrels, who it turns out like to eat garbage, so they're thriving. <laughs> of course they uh, are. <laughs> yeah, they're fine. They're fine. Um, but the Large Binocular Telescope is the first of the extremely large telescopes to be built. And it was built decades ahead of everyone else. And the reason they were able to do this is they have two side-by-side 8.4-meter telescopes that give the observing capacity in terms of resolving on the axis of the width of the facility of over 22 meters. Right. So it is an interferometer. Yes. The, the, these two 8.4 meter telescopes, that's the same size as each of the telescopes of the very large, you know, the very large telescope has four of them, but they have two of them side by side that can act like an interferometer. And you get this phenomenal resolving power from these two telescopes. It would be better if they were in the mountains of Chile or in the South Pole, but the fact that they are readily available and accessible from a lot of places in the U.S. makes them just like one of the most perfect telescopes that have been built so far. And and one of the, the real pioneering things, and that's going to be a common word in the show, that yeah. they did with the Large Binocular Telescope, with the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, system of four telescopes and a bunch of little one meters down in Chile. These are all separate domes. They can each work independently. And, often and then do. they just combine yeah. the data with fiber optics. With large binocular telescope, they figured out how to build a single mount for both these mammoth mirrors side by side so that they get moved around the sky together. Yeah, This is a pair of binoculars with over eight meter telescopes and it's amazing like the mirror lab builds a lot of the mirrors for the world's telescopes yeah and it is amazing how long it takes them to cast and grind these mirrors they will take cool. years and years to build yeah. these mirrors for people it, it the cooling alone because they have to keep them rotating at certain rates so that as they cool, they cool correctly so they have fans and they don't change shape as they're cooling. It's, it's a really complicated process, but it's right there at Kitt Peak. Yeah. And, and these are fabulous facilities. Kitt Peak does have night assistance. <laughs> Here, McDonald's is a little bit better. It's just that eight-hour drive. Right. Uh things you think about as a grad student. No, it's the, the American Southwest, it's not as high in altitude as Chile, but it still has that drier atmosphere that makes working in the infrared a little bit more tenable. Yeah. It's, it's not as dark as places like Hawaii, because we do have cities. You do see Phoenix on the horizon at Kitt Peak. But you can test ideas and yeah. you can still do truly amazing research. And these are some of the darkest places in America 
and the driest and the highest. And it's this combination of dark, dry, and high, even if they're not over 10,000 feet, even if they do get more than three millimeters of water a year. It allows the science to happen yeah. with lower cost and with experimentation with lower risk. There's two instruments that are brand new that are in the Southwest that I wanted to just mention. One is called the, it's called the NUOD Planet Finding Spectrometer, which is done by Penn State. Jason Wright uh, and, and team uh, was talking to me about it. And this is going to be a really powerful telescope for the radial velocity method. And so this is the way that they can actually detect the mass of planets. And all of the instruments that are out there right now that we're familiar with, Kepler, TESS, all these space-based ones, they, are, they use the transit method to detect these planets. And so they can't determine the mass. They can only determine the size of the planet. And so you've got these really good instruments. One, it's attached to the wind telescope that you mentioned. Uh, and then there's an, another one called the Habitable Planet Finder, another. So there's two really sensitive radial velocity instruments that are being installed in the American Southwest, which will help target the mass of planets that are orbiting right now around red, uh, red dwarf stars. And that will lead into some of the work that's going to be done in the next decade to find the Earth-sized worlds orbiting stars like our sun. And so yes. you're, we are going to get confirmation of Earth mass worlds orbiting red dwarf stars thanks to a lot of these new instruments, which we actually don't have. So, again, done in the American Southwest. So it really is. I mean, I think if you had to pick, like, the top three places in the world, you've got Hawaii, you've got Chile, and you've got the American Southwest as the yeah. as the three places where the big astronomy work gets done. And then I think also the Canary Islands. I'll give Yeah, yeah. I, I would the say Canary that's the Islands is yeah. in there. It's pretty yeah. great too. All right. Well, before we we get on to uh, say goodbye, have you got some names to read this week? I do. So so thank you to all our patrons. I love that there's so many of you. I can't get through all your names every week. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Here we go. Thank you to Jordan Young. Thank you to Burry Gowan. Thank you to John Yorsk. And I have your box of, of paper spacecraft. Thank you. They're awesome. Um, thank you to Andrew Polstra. Thank you to David Trogue. Thank you to Brian Cagle. Thank you to the giant nothing. Thank you to Ramji Anamathu. Thank you to Robert Palasma. Thank you to Corey Diwali. Thank you to Josh Cunningham. Thank you to Emily Patterson. Thank you to Dana Nori. Thank you to Joseph Hoy. Thank you to Chauncey Wilson. Thank you to Kjartan Svari. Someday, please tell me how to actually say that. Thank you to Helga Bjorkog. Thank you to Bill Hamilton. Thank you to Frank Trippin. Thank you to Richard Riviera. And I'm going to stop there. All right. Uh, more next week. Uh, again, thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Stop. Um, and we've got uh, one minute. <laughs> okay. Quick. Uh quick questions folks all right uh, uh let's see if i can i choose one question i have a question yes i posted that the that it was a photograph of a black hole event horizon and a lot of people are are griping at me and saying that it's not actually a photograph and i want to here's my thinking it's taken okay. with the electromagnetic spectrum. It is photons. They happen to be in radio waves. But if, yeah. if, if that black hole is moving towards us very fast, then the light would be redshifted into visible light if it was moving away from us, right? It's elect So, I mean, what is a photograph? Uh, is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope using hydrogen no. alpha and so, sulfur and oxygen a photograph? What about so a picture the from the it in graduate school is it's a photo if it's a chemical reaction whoa it's an 
image if it's a photoelectric reaction. So photographs require the chemical coatings that you get on gra on glass plates, on film. Yeah. Uh, it, if you use a digital camera, it's not a photo. It's not a photograph. Image. Yeah. Right. But so but let's say that we're going to use like the, you know, obviously it's a photograph. If I show you a, a photograph on a, on my phone, it's a photograph. It's an image. It's a photograph. It's an image. I, I, it's a, oh, killing me. So if, if, no way, it's a photo. <laughs> can I use so the word photo as opposed to photograph? Yes, I'm, I, that, that we right. can be okay with All because right. that's become the nomenclature that they use on the software. Yeah. So, so since Instagram talks about posting your photos, we can yeah. go with that. Yeah. But, but just like it's uh, no longer a spectrograph, it's a spectrometer because they're doing photometry counting yeah. photons yeah. instead of recording it on a chemical medium. Okay, fine. Then I'm going to – and so the point is that once you go into it being a photo, yes, then anything with, with photons is yes. a photo. Yes. And, and like when you see an image from Cassini, you're actually seeing three separate wavelengths of infrared light. When you see yes. a picture from Hubble, you might be seeing the spectrum from infrared, hydrogen alpha, and ultraviolet. And yet people will call you. If you see something from Spitzer, it is three different wavelengths of different very cold infrared light. And yes. when you see this picture from the – um, from the Event Horizon Telescope, you are seeing photons of radio at the 1.2 millimeter spectrum, but they are still photons, and yes. they are being visually represented. And so it is a photo as – so if you – Of if, the Event Horizon, not of the of black, the black hole. hole. Yes. It's a shadow of the black yes. hole. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I still even think that it's a photo of a black hole. Because I mean, is a, if it's if you the photo of a region of a black hole, sure. If you want to be okay. super specific, but you know, I you I live, I, you know, I I have to tighten my titles down, so I'm happy to do so that. So, but would you agree that it's it is as much a photo? Yes, a photo. If you say graph, I'll have words, but photo, I'm good <laughs> it's, with. It's as much of a photo yes. as an image on your phone is that has been taken or a photo yeah. taken by Cassini or a photo that's taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Yes. All right, good. Then I'm going to I'm going to make a whole video where I just <laughs> tear in to these people who are who are telling me that I shouldn't be saying that it's a photo. And I don't think I said photograph, but I will check. Maybe I did. And then I then I'm wrong again. So it, it happens to all of us. I was wrong on binaries until you pointed out. There you go. Out. I'll, I'll dig you up that research and send it over to you. Sounds good. Right on. Okay, well, we've reached okay. the end of our show. Uh, now we're going to cut it short. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, we will see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. And I don't know how long I'm supposed to wait before I actually stop the broadcast. People say it always cuts short. And so I'm just going to keep talking. And I'm going to press the button randomly. And then something's going to get short. But people will probably be glad that it gets cut short. There, I just pressed the button.